very exciting for me and also a little terrifying. <laughs> so, and of course, the Shubir, who has been a friend for a very long time, uh, it's good to be uh, uh, to have him as part of this event. And also the younger faculty of uh, the English department, and that is uh, Modu Chanda and Monique Inkini. And also we have another student from Calcutta University, a student of ours, his, her name is Oindrila. So I'm so happy that I'm not among strangers. I am among friends. And so I think my terror should really get translated into a sense of comfort and uh, the topic today which i discussed with uh, shubir and we decided that probably i should speak on the evolution of american literature and i would just like to begin with certain uh, references to the time when i was a student of american literature and for us at that time, it was a little different in terms of our perception of America. America now is regarded as the promised land by the rest of the world. America is synonymous with material prosperity, material comforts, a land of opportunities, a dream of success translated into reality with the enabling power of the green dollars. For me, America, as for most of us, is not North America. That is USA and Canada. But the United States of America, that is those 50 states and the mesmeric attractions in terms of various signifiers that we have in our minds in terms of images, symbols, and metaphors. These perhaps are New York, Chicago, Florida, California, Hollywood, poetry, novels, short stories of America, its culture, music, films, food, McDonald's, KFC, Pizza Hut, blue jeans, t-shirts, tattoos, etc. I would but, like to make but, a confession. But, what, uh, but why not uh, South America? Why not South America? Uh, that is probably because South America is also about knowing a few other languages. And uh, the literature of the United States is Anglophone. And so it is uh, those of us who do not know Spanish, it would be very difficult in terms of uh, Latin America to be able to really reach the culture only through translations. Vice Chancellor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I would like to make a confession, and this is anecdotal. Being an incorrigible romantic, I opted for American literature as the at the master's level at Calcutta, Calcutta University, and American literature was my a paper of specialization because I was besotted by the novels and short stories of Ernest Hemingway, which were introduced to me as a high school student by my father. I hero worshipped Ernest Hemingway from the time I had read his novels, For Whom the Bell Tolls, A Farewell to Arms, and The Old Man and the Sea, among others. He was a rock star for me, as he was a rock star for many of my friends at Presidency College at that time. Hemingway was a great admirer and friend of two other uh, rock stars whom we really loved at that time. Though these were Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. And there was no question of being judgmental about any of them. Eventually, as I was reborn as a feminist reader, I became skeptical about Hemingway's MCP stances but I did not delete him from my list of favorite writers. I remember an outstanding star professor of Jadapur University dismissing American literature as trivial and appallingly below standard when I had very proudly told him that my area of specialization was American literature and I was working towards a doctorate degree in it. 
in that time also the mecca for american literature studies was the american studies research center hyderabad many of us felt quite pompous when the sobriquet american americanist was attached to our ethnic names so with that preamble i want to now begin the journey tracking the evolution of american literature as as an epigraph i would first like to refer to t s eliot's oft referenced essay it's titled american literature and the american language and t s eliot had written who could be more greek than odysseus or more german than forced or more spanish than don quixote or more american than huck finn yet each one of them is a kind of archetype in the mythology of men of all men everywhere and that and then comes the more crucial part which is about tracking evolution and i would like you to listen to this carefully a living literature is always in process of change contemporaneous living literatures are always through one or more authors changing each other and the literature written in america in future generations will you may be sure render obsolete any formulations of what is american based on the work of writers up to and including those writing so now i would like to ask uh, monique kinney to please share the uh, slides right ma'am on this it i was warned that i should not even venture to share the slides myself and i could <laughs> well understand why so i thought oh since i am getting monikin kini who is going to take all the bother now and so she has been very nice about screen sharing with me ma'am is the screen visible to you yes perfectly is it visible to everyone else yes yes ma'am it's visible thank you yes so shall we go to the first slide then Yes. Actually, people are still pouring in. Okay, the then let's keep it like that. I will keep on talking a little more. Yeah, I'm just there. on the first, first slide. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. This is all right. So, I my first point would be that American literature, and this is what I have always done in my first class in uh, where I met the students for the first time who had opted. for american literature at the ma level and uh i would often ask them that well why did you even uh, want to take up this american literature as an optional paper and most of them didn't know why and then probably uh some of them would come up with a few names of a few authors that they had read and then i the point that i always wanted to make uh, as a preamble would be american literature and english literature share the same language which means that the 26 alphabets are common to both and there is the end of the sharing this apart from sharing of the 26 alphabets American literature is not a replication of English literature or for that matter British literature. If you look at the map as such, the USA is large but not so huge as were as it seems when you look at say Africa as the continent. But and then we are looking at the 50 states. So how but then largely we know that the united states of america is a land of immigrants all were 
who reached America were generally visitors, generally explorers, and generally settlers. It was not about empire building, as in the case of India. That is the major difference. The British did not want to build an empire in the USA as they did in India. Now, let us see how this happened, really. I would not go into too many details, then we will have to miss out the literature if you go on for too much of history. But just a few in order to uh, set the literature in context. So next slide, please. Can we go to the next slide? Yes. So all of us yes, know. It's taking a little bit of time, but uh, I've already shifted. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Is it all right now? Should I carry on? Yeah. So yes, 1492, Christopher Columbus discovers America. And as you know from your um, first acquaintance with your history books that Christopher Columbus had set out to discover India or to reach India. And thankfully, a very bad compass directed him towards the America. And so instead of going all the way down to India, he it was <laughs> an entirely different route. It was radically almost the opposite route that he followed. And when he reached um, the United States, he just leapt around and said, well, I'm in India. And for us Indians, I suppose it's a big relief. Otherwise, if the Spanish had occupied India, then there would be Spanish language and literature departments in every university of India, as we find in the prevalence of English literature departments in every university of India. We do not have a Bengali literature department in most of the universities outside West Bengal, but English literature department. So that is what uh, empire is all about. And so Christopher Columbus, as you notice, he uh, moved there with three ships and uh, lovely names, those Nina and Pinta and Santa Maria out of the Spanish port of Peos. His objective was to sail west until he reached Asia, then in the Indies, where, where the riches of gold, pearls and spice awaited him. All right. Next slide, please. Now, when he went there, it wasn't a barren land. It wasn't as if there were no people there. The Native Americans were there. If you look at those, the picture on my left carefully, you will notice that on the coastal shores, the Native Americans are looking at the arrival of these strange ships. And the Native Americans had already a, go, a very um, prosperous civilization of their own, as they had in Mexico, as they also had in Latin America. But as you know, and from your uh, watching of the Western movies also, you know that how these Native Americans, huge numbers were totally exterminated. Now, at least many survived. In the case of Australia, it was worse. The indigenous people of Australia were very much a part of Australia. And Captain Cook declared that this is a terra nullius. That is, it is a no man's land. There is no human being there. That is how it was recorded in the British Charter. Australia as terra nullius, and naturally, it would be a white settler colony. In the case of um, America, however, meaning, of course, the United States uh, precisely, this history was a little different. 
But then uh, along with the Spanish, there were the Dutch explorers, there were the Portuguese, there were the French, and of course, the English. The English were the greatest maritime power at, at that time, say from the 16th century onwards. Even in the 15th, they tried, even uh, Sweden tried, but then Sweden was so unlucky that within, say, half an hour of the huge ship trying to reach India, the ship sank. And you can see the sunk ship in a museum in Stockholm. So anyway, so from the Native Americans, let's go on to the next slide. So the naming of America, Columbus did not really name the place that he reached America. In fact, he did not really reach the United States. He was more in the Bahamas and the West Indies. And it is later Spanish explorers who really went deeper into the American mainland. So, and therefore the name America comes from another of the explorers who soon followed. His name was Amerigo Vespucci, the Italian explorer who ex explored the new continents in the following years. So it, the credit does not go entirely to Columbus, but at the same time, what we also notice that throughout the United States, even today, there is a holiday announced on the 12th of October, both in Spain and in, uh, in the USA. And it is called the Columbus Day in both these places. And Columbus Day is celebrated in the United States and uh, in the second uh, week of October annually. Now, however, these explorers were not as successful as the British. The British ships went out to settle immediately. And the first batch of British ships, as most of you know, that went out, we find that those ships were ones where there was a double agenda. One is to deport all the very difficult criminals who could not any uh, be contained in the British jails and the jails in London, like the Newgate prison. And so it would be a good dumping yard for all these recalcitrant um, uh, citizens of Britain. Both America as well as Australia became the sort of receiving ground of all the scoundrels, criminals, fraud stars and uh, fraudsters and all corrupt people of uh, uh, mainland Britain. Now, though it was strongly puritanical at that time, which I would like to address as English America. The British colonies in North America were known as British America and the British West, West Indies until 1776, when the 13 colonies located along the Atlantic seaboard declared their independence and formed the United States of America. British America gained large amounts of new territory following the Treaty of Paris, which ended British involvement in the Seven Years' War. At the start of the American War of Independence in 1775, the British Empire included 20 colonies. But later on, they acquired more of these colonies and the remaining continental colonies of British North America formed the dominion of Canada, ultimately, which was not a part of the United States. Now, that being, an, as I said, shared language, English, not shared literature and replication of British or European literature. In Canada, it was a different ballgame. It was not only English literature, but uh, French Canada was very much perceptible. And that part is even now uses French as its first language. 
But what they forgot in Canada is what the Americans also forgot. There was the Canadian First Nation Aboriginal people. Now let us move on to the next slide. The literary periods, because we can't just spend the whole night doing this, and those who we said, yes, you can go on till midnight or beyond, but uh, let's go on to literature. And so these are the well-known periods. Any student of American literature uh, more or less are familiar with this. Next slide, please. So in these literary periods that you just uh, noticed, what we, uh, however, should keep in mind that when America became free, which is why American academics, uh, faculty members often say that, well, as you are post-colonial, we are post-colonial too, because the American War of Independence, which led to Jefferson, uh, uh, signing the Constitution and the Declaration, which was about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, that is so different from most of the world's other constitutional one-liner declarations. In India, it is about justice, liberty, equality, and fraternity. But pursuit of happiness is an entirely cultural emphasis that we notice in that one phrase. And many of you may have even watched movies like The Pursuit of Happiness. And that is about American initiative, American enterprise, American opportunities. We are slowly coming to that sort of a cultural exceptionalism, which qualifies America as being a very different culture and not a mimicry of everything that has been British in the uh, despite the dominance of British culture in America up to the 19th century. So I would now like to move on to another period. What therefore is uh, is those parts that we do not notice in terms of looking at the burgeoning of American literature and culture, the arrival of certain ideas, and not only writers, ideas which were invading America at that time. And some of it was coming from even India. The Indologists seem to have made a great impact on early 19th century American writers. Now, the first thing that the American writers seem to, uh, writers, thinkers, and even the parish priests seem to point out about America is probably its cultural barrenness. And this cultural sterility or barrenness is what uh, the first known uh, traveler, who is a French native and a map maker, uh, his name is Hector Saint Jean de Crevicure. I don't know whether I'm uh, pronouncing it correctly. He wrote a very long essay where he used, interestingly, a defining one-liner. And he didn't say, who is an American? He says, what is an American? And there he says, he describes the America that these new settlers had in, inherited. And so in 1782, that is after American independence, the first point that is noticed by Kruf Cure is the fact that it is not really under the shadow 
of the old world, that is Europe. It is not, and he writes, it is not composed as in Europe of great lords who possess everything and a herd of people who have nothing. Here are no aristocratical families, no courts, no kings, no bishops, no ecclesiastical dominion, no invisible power giving to a few a very visible one, no great manufacturers employing thousands, no great refinements of luxury. The rich and the poor are not so far removed from each other as they are in Europe. Some few towns accepted, we are all tillers of the earth from Nova Scotia to West Florida. So he uh, traces the entire North America, not concentrating only on uh, the United States. And he says, if a traveler travels through our rural districts, he views not the hostile castle and the haughty mansion contrasted with the clay built hut and miserable cabin where cattle and men help to keep each other warm and dwell in meanness, smoke and indigence. So at that time, way back in 1782, he is talking about inclusiveness. Inclusiveness suddenly has become a rediscovered term and a, also a fashionable term. But in 1782, Hector Crovecure had talked about this, that all the common people of the world could handhold. And he was also talking in terms of identifying not only people, but also the domesticated animals. So there is an element of post-humanism as well in this sort of a good bonding between all sentient beings. Next slide, please. Oh. All right. Now, see this. This is Reverend Sidney Smith. He was a little angry when the Americans fought that war, you know, about the Boston Tea Party, and then uh, the Br uh, British had to wi uh, uh, withdraw from the American shores in terms of not being able to be in full control of America. It had its own government. And so Sidney Smith in Edinburgh, that means in the UK, in Scotland, in the Edinburgh Review of 1820, a newspaper of which he was the editor himself, he lamented that America had no culture. In the four quarters of the globe, who reads an American book? Remember the Jadapur University professor who reprimanded me for studying American literature? It's the same attitude. Who reads an American book or goes to an American play or looks at an American picture or statue? What does the world yet owe to American physicians or surgeons? What new substances have their chemists discovered? And then he goes on and uh, goes on and on and says, who drinks out of American glasses or eats from American plates or wears American coats or gowns or sleeps in American blankets? Finally, under which of the old tyrannical governments of Europe is every sixth man a slave whom his fellow creatures may buy and sell and torture? As if the British did not have their own number of uh, African slaves who were not called slaves, but were absolutely bonded labor in the aristocratic uh, domains of Britain at around the same time. But naturally, the numbers were much, much less because after all, the size of England is also not to be compared with the United States. So I will now move on to another movement that was just burgeoning 1820 a sense of dismissal but at the same time i said that well there were there was a notion especially the harvard university had a wealth of books 
on Indology, again, because of uh, extremely careful and wise British looting of those books, which reached the Harvard University, many of them. And so let us go on to the next slide. Now, can we, I think I, I will not go into more details about Crove Cure. Can we go on to the next slide, please? All right. Now, James Fenimore Cooper, a frontier writer, was probably one of the first white Americans who tried to showcase not only the emergence, but the slow eliding and then a complete absence of the Native Americans. And the last of the Mohicans, which is not a textbook that is used in most of our curriculum, but it is an important book in terms of trying to find out how the white had a relationship with, say, Nati Bumpo, as we notice here. Next slide, please. So, but then again, James Fenimore Cooper was also lamenting the lack of culture in America. No manners for the dramatist, no obscure fictions for the writer of romance, no gross and hardy offenses against decorum for the moralist, nor any of the rich artificial auxiliaries of poetry. Let's move on. Next slide. And then from 1830 onwards, or begins a sort of movement which is sometimes described as the American literary renaissance, sometimes described as the period of American transcendentalism. Now, transcendentalism was nothing about transcendental meditation of the 1970s when everybody did drugs. Transcendentalism here would mean the transcendentalist movement, which encompassed many beliefs, but these all fit into their three main values of individualism, idealism, and the divinity of nature. Just because all of you who are present are students mostly, just reflect on around this period, that is the mid 19th century, what the British literature was showcasing, mostly society, mostly the urban uh, areas in terms of especially London. Think of Charles Dickens, think of Thackeray, and think of what was happening in American literature and culture and philosophy. And individualism, idealism, and the divinity of nature, which is why uh, a particular text, a British text by a woman, which I love to teach at once, uh, once upon a time, that was Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. And some of the critics of literature have commented that Wuthering Heights seemed so odd as part of British literature of the 19th century. But if that was transported into America at around that same time, it would have been totally in sync. It would have been absolutely blended with, with what was being written at America at around that time. And you can think in terms of Hawthorne's novel, The Scarlet Letter, among others. So Transcendentalism was an idealistic literary and philosophical movement of the mid 19th century. It began in New England in 1836 and various visionaries, intellectuals like um, 
Emerson, as you see here, and Thoreau, who inspired Mahatma Gandhi. And among many others, they started discussing spiritual ideas. And they were mostly ideas which became uh, more and more, more popular through the advocacy and of the Brahmo Shamaj. And so this was about the union of God and the fact that organized religion probably was not the answer. So the Boston newspapers, which advertised uh, the meetings of Ra Rolf Waldo Emerson, who was the greatest intellectual of that time and looked upon as an iconic leader, iconic thinker, and absolutely one who would be a trailblazer and a pathfinder for the emergence of American literature. So shall we go on to the next slide? So that's Thoreau and, and the Walton Pond. He almost self-exiled himself from urban uh, America, from suburban America, and spent the life of a recluse around Walden Pond so that he could meditate in peace. Next slide, please. And his sort of uh, connection with nature, connection with all the attributes of nature is much beyond what Wordsworth had taught us in the early 19th century. And see how he uh, locates nature and human nature. I took a walk in the woods and came out taller than the trees. Did he really uh, become taller than the trees and become some sort of a huge Brobdingnagian? It's not about that. It's just the metaphor that he could meditate and he could re-emerge as a human being rather than being just a human animal, a sentient creature. So transcendentalism affected American literature and culture in a huge manner at around this time. Next slide. So transcendentalism was in, I, I went through this. Will you, can we go on to the next one? The other very popular and often talked about even now, and with which I even began this presentation this e early evening, is the American dream. The term was coined by writer and historian James Thrustlow Adams in his best-selling 1931 book, The Epic of America. He described it as that dream of a land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for everyone with opportunity for each according to ability or achievement. Here too, the emphasis seems to be more on enterprise and initiative. But by this time, things were a little different. And America was slowly and surely stepping towards be emerging as one of the world's most powerful capitalist societies. So, and then, of course, with the uh, economic slump at the end of the 19th century and another in the beginning of the uh, 20th century, the emphasis on material wealth, the need for material wealth, was so very uh, unabashed that would lead to Wall Street. And now, of course, uh, when we look at it all, we think in terms of that one phrase, greed is good. So shall we go on to the next one? Next slide, please. Next slide, yeah. So the American dream, 
progress is a good thing independent self-reliant individual will triumph let us go on from this again it's a new eden a promised land and so what were their basic needs and you notice that there is personal freedom and then there is basic uh, needs uh, like housing like electricity achieving uh, one's potential having enough uh, free time living in harmony with nature achieving affluence and here again let me uh, revert to an anecdote that somebody asked uh, an indian who had found a job there and then the person said won't you return home and he said barite thakle muri kheta mami ekhane sausage khacchi i will not go back so let us go on to the next slide now in the 19th century these two writers one a poet and another a fictionist both of them had the exceptional free mind of the american what they were writing was not a continuation of british literature they were using those same alphabets but what they were producing was absolutely free from all the hierarchical dominance which qualifies the entire old order that is both europe and of course britain so walt whitman and mark twain and see that little remark by mark twain the very ink with which all history is written is merely fluid prejudice in fact mark twain even visited kolkata and stayed at the great eastern Hot hotel initially and then on to the fairlawn hotel which is tucked away on sudder street i have not visited it yet and i hope i i will be able to visit it before i die so next so what sort of poetry was whitman writing look at that i sing the body electric remember all the british poems you have read up to this point of time and so i sing the body electric the armies of those i love engirth me and i engirt them they will not let me off till I go with them, respond to them, and disrupt them. This is 1855. And if you look at a poem written in the 17th century about America by John Donne, a poem which is to his mistress going to bed, the first poem about America, what is it? It is about triumph. It is about imperial order. And I'll just read a few lines of to his mistress going to bed license my roving hands and let them go before behind between above below so a total objectif objectification of not only the object of desire this in this case a woman but much more than that so before oh my america writes done Oh, my newfound land, my kingdom safeliest when with one man manned. See the erotic exuberance of those lines. My mine of precious stones, my empire, how blessed am I in this discovering thee. So, though it is just a mis mistress whom he is addressing, but his voice is that of Napoleon or Genghis Khan. Yes. So, and then if you look at another one, see Moll Flanders. Many of you, the students, have probably read this. In Moll Flanders, too, we find that there is so much of emphasis on America and how Moll Flanders finds wealth in America by marrying a person whom she met in Britain 
he did not have enough money and then they went off to america to virginia and there this guy had a uh, huge acres of plantation and so she too became rich along with her very rich husband but we will not go into that story anymore because there was again a lot of uh, sort of destabilization of mol's life later on so if we look at this poem again look at the emphasis on the body in a very different way the armies of those i love engirth me and i engirth them they will not let me off till i go with them was i doubted that those who corrupt their own bodies conceal themselves and if those who defile the living are as bad as they who defile the dead and if the body does not do fully as much as the soul and if the body were not the soul what is the soul so body and soul are not apart but almost a part of each other and this sort of integrity of the body and the soul is something which must be linked to pursuit of happiness shall we go on to the next slide this is the song of myself i don't know i i somehow the font size became so small i couldn't understand why i celebrate myself and sing myself and what i assume you shall notice i loaf and invite i loaf and invite my soul remember britain at around this time there was no question of loafing and inviting your souls and i lean and loaf at my ease observing a spear of summer grass my tongue every atom of my blood formed from this soil this air both here of parents born here from parents the same i now 37 years old in perfect health begin hoping to seize not till death and that is american individualism american assertive uh, identity next let us move on to the next slide all right so when we move from here to mark twain mark twain's this is the one liner i had to pick up because we have a long way to travel and already one hour is almost being uh, is over and i do not want you to bore you to death but huck finn the explosive declaration all right then i'll go to hell by a young teenager barely 13 or 14 years old dismissing all the tenets of the christian religion and saying that he was ready to go to hell why because he wanted to protect the black american slave all right then i'll go to hell and so as you know from our reading of the bible the genesis the black men their notion was that the black man men have been created by god to serve the white men so here was the first absolute dismissal there is uh, if you see those words you will find that those are gen mostly are monosyllabic words i'll go to hell and so this declaration is a declaration of a new world a brave new world that was emerging culturally socially psychologically in terms of the collective culture next please now when we come to the 20th century and writers look back towards all those who wrote in the 19th century hemingway made a remark which is oft quoted he said the good writers were henry james stephen crane and mark twain that's not the order they are good in and then he says 
all modern American literature comes from the one book by Mark Twain called Huckleberry Finn. Remember? All right, then I'll go to hell. That's Huck Finn. If you read it, you must stop where the nigger Jim is stolen from the boys. That is the real end. But it's the best book we have had. All American writing comes from that. There was nothing before. There has been nothing as good since. That is the characteristic flamboyance of Ernest Hemingway's inimitable style of handling language. But what he was talking about is the fact that here was Mark Twain emerging free of the shackles which uh, Hawthorne could not in his representation of the Scarlet Letter. He, of course, was critical of the entire um, uh, culture, the puritanical culture of the times. But Mark Twain set Huckleberry Finn free, free from society. And he said uh, later on also, in the beginning, as well as the end of the novel of Huckleberry Finn, he says he would have nothing to do with society, nothing to do with going back to society. He said that he had enough of that and he would rather be a loner. So let's go on to the next one. Ernest Hemingway and won the Nobel Prize, as you know, John Steinbeck, who wrote about society who was in a way very conscious of uh, societal oppression uh, and corruption by the corporates at that time we, who were emerging. Hemingway did not really concentrate on that because Hemingway's novels were generally based out of the United States. John Steinbeck, however, was very different. He was addressing the problems within the United States. And he was also thinking about the masses. And the elite and the masses were absolutely confrontational in most of his very, very powerful novels. And of course, you notice how handsome these two men are. So quite uh, interesting in, in the, those terms as well. So let us go on to the next slide. And Hemingway made certain declarations. One in the old man and the sea, a man is not made for defeat. A man can be destroyed, but not defeated. And again, in a farewell to arms, he said, the world breaks everyone. And afterwards, many are strong at the broken places. But those that it will not break, it kills. It kills the very good and the very gentle and the very brave impartially. So that brings us back to Shakespeare also, is, isn't it? As flies to wanton boys are we to the gods, they kill us for their sport. So it's precisely that feeling that we find re-echoed through centuries in this statement of Hemingway's. Shall we go on to the next one? Now, the women writers, up to this point of time, the women writers were absolutely neglected in 19th century America. It was all about men. And it was all whenever uh, the transcendentalists wrote their essays, they would always address the men. The women were not those who were in their horizon in the literary horizon at all. But there were women writers. And many of these women writers were in correspondence with the British women writers of the time and also the British suffragists. That is, they were all clamoring for voting rights. Just This was just the rudimentary emergence of uh, women writers, that is Margaret Fuller. And Margaret Fuller, in the same way in which uh, Sidney uh, Smith and the others talked about the lack of culture and the emergence of the necessity for American culture to emerge, American literature to emerge, which even um, uh, Walt Whitman talked about it also in Dem Democratic Vistas. And then we find that Margaret Fuller herself said it has to be about 
America, about the soil of America, the flora and fauna of America. In, in that sense, when a literary text is able to represent the very flavor of America in terms of sense perceptions, in terms of extrasensory perceptions, only then it can be American literature. And so she says, it does not follow because many books are written by persons born in America that there exists an American literature. Books which imitate or represent the thoughts and life of Europe do not constitute an American literature. Before such an exit, an original idea must animate this nation and fresh currents of life must call into life fresh thoughts along its shores. Margaret Fuller also wrote a very important book, especially for feminist scholars. It's called The American Woman. It was almost uh, sort of the American answer to the vindication of the rights of women uh, by Mary Wollstonecraft, which was published, I think, in 1792. And this came a little later in uh, the middle of the 18th uh, of the 19th century. Emily Dickinson, shy, reclusive, very Victorian. Look at their clothes, very Victorian. In terms of garments, they were replicating British fashion of women's clothing. But their minds were very, very free. Next, please. Harriet Beecher Stowe, almost a rival of Mark Twain, because when she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, Mark Twain was not terribly happy with that one because may, many people said that that was what led to the American Civil War. And Mark Twain always thought his Huck Finn was responsible for the Civil War. There was a constant competition between them. And of course, Mark Twain emerged as the commercial winner. He had a huge mansion shaped like a design, like a ship. And Harriet Beecher Stowe had a little cottage almost next to Mark Twain's huge mansion. And if you go to Connecticut near Yale University, you should uh, not fail to take a look at Mark Twain's house and Harriet Beecher Stowe. And that is gender studies for you. Louisa M. Alcott, you are also familiar with uh, Little Women and Good Wives. Let's go on to the next. And uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, now the emergence of the feminist voice. We are just, just hearing that, but only very little of the echoes, but they are claiming a space for themselves. Next, please. The yellow wallpaper often studied. And see from the yellow wallpaper, if a physician of high standing and one's own husband assures friends and relatives that there is really nothing the matter with one but temporary nervous depression, a slight hysterical tendency, what is one to do? So if a woman claimed, uh, experienced a sense of claustrophobia, was uh, psychologically not un unwell, there was an issue of mental health, there was a, a issue of disorientation. It was all attributed to hysteria and all emerging from the uterus. Next, please. And Kate Chopin, and we have uh, again the feeling that what we consider to be what family life is showcased as looking at his wife as one looks at a valuable piece of property which has suffered some damage. This is almost echoing, uh, say, John Goldsworthy, the man of property, the Forsyth saga, England, America. There was tremendous correspondence between them, not only in terms of what was being written in Britain, being sold and consumed by the American um, uh, readers, but also the sort of a shared culture in some way emerging, especially among the women writers. Next, please. And so the women writers of the 20th century that 
some many of us are familiar with shall we go on to the pictures now next one so what had happened at around this time when the women writers were emerging by the middle of the 20th century a book was written by betty friedan this book is called the feminine mystique and that led to the second women's liberation movement the first one was at the beginning of the 20th century and it was for the voting rights of women both in the old world that is in europe and then on to america but the second women's liberation movement concentrated in the united states and here such questions betty friedan said there is a problem without a name which is leading to the collective depression of the women in america and then she declared along with all the other activists of her time that the personal is the political next slide next yes and when the personal is the political can you recognize where these two people are uh, reading a book this is our oxford bookstore that is ruchira gupta and gloria stanum one of the uh, feminist um, yeah absolutely shreya sure. and so and this is uh, a meet that ruchira gupta of apne aap the ngo she had invited um, gloria stenum and she is reading from gloria stenum's book next one please and this is about gender politics politics and joyce carol oats the woman on the right Uh, attitude in terms of interpreting relationships between men and women remained a liberal humanist understanding but the woman on the other side and i don't know why the slide did not take the name of this woman her name is marilyn french and she wrote a book called the women's room it is really a, almost an explosive reversal of what we had already read in virginia wolf's a room of one's own but this one was questioning everything that has been glorified as being feminine the appearance of the woman the accessories women wear women's wifehood motherhood and everything is explained in such a bitter way you would think it has been written by jonathan swift reborn as marilyn french next one please other writers again a white um, american feminist writer uh, adrian rich who of course was also talking about uh, what we consider to be the normative practice of recognizing compulsory heterosexuality but she also talked about homophobia she also talked about same sex relationships this is the first time that these were openly being discussed in american literature in her poetry also in her prose writings and tyler again like very much like joyce uh, carol oats had the more liberal humanist understanding of man women relationships next please and then we come to african american literature which begins with the slave narrative it is a type of literary genre involving the autobiographical accounts of enslaved africans particularly in the americas over 6000 such narratives are estimated to exist about 150 narratives were published as separate books or pamphlets incidentally william andrews visited calcutta university and where we held the first conference on african american literature and this was his book which he presented to the english department 
And so it is a great moment really to recollect the fact that William Andrews, Bill Andrews, as we called him, uh, could be present in Calcutta and take part as the keynote speaker of that conference. Next, please. And the American Civil War is absolutely crucial for understanding African-American literature. And it is also a politically incorrect way of speaking if we say Afro-American literature, as many do. We should be very conscious about being able to enunciate both African-American literature. See, and who are fighting? It's not the blacks and the whites who are fighting. It's the whites against the whites. Yes, the plantation owners and the Yankees that is, those around the east coast of America. And the others, the plantation owners, the people, the white people of the Bible Belt, who were huge owners of land. Next. And then comes, uh, once the Civil War, uh, was over, Abraham Lincoln took over, and then, as you know, he was also assassinated. But by the beginning of the 20th century, a new resistance happened. And there was uh, writers like Zora Neale Hurst, Langston Hughes, about whom you have heard, you must have read him also. Next slide, please. The Harlem Renaissance happened in the 1920s, and this is the voice of African Americans. You have to recognize the fact that the Harlem Renaissance, as a matter of fact, even now, how many of us visit the Harlem when we go to New York? But if we don't do that, we are thinking, we are ex uh, sort of underscoring the fact that this marginalization is in our minds. Next. The civil rights movement around the 1960s, you see Martin Luther King, he even came to India, he went to Kerala, where he was introduced as a Dalit in a classroom by a teacher, you will find that in his autobiography. And he later on understood what Dalit meant. And he said, Yes, I'm a Dalit from the United States. Next slide, please. The civil uh, rights movement led to the civil uh, black arts movement. And you know about uh, the black arts movement and the Ku Klux Klan and the tremendous sacrifices that the African Americans made in order to establish the fact that they should not be victims of identity politics of, or cultural politics. Next, please. Uh, Maya Angelou, Toni Morrison, and Toni Morrison is the first African-American writer and the first African-American woman writer who got the Nobel Prize. And that is Maya Angelou, who is also a very, very powerful writer. None of them are living now. Next, please. I will now rush through the rest of the slides. Uh, because uh, we, I'm taking up too much time and in, I know how tired you must be by now. And so the Native American writers absolutely marginalized, even now. We do not seem to be having uh, many of their books in our syllabus. But once again, it's crucial that one needs to familiar, familiarize oneself with 
with the writings of the Native American writers who are now emerging. And uh, what they are trying to do is to recover the oral histories of their times and try to see whether they could reconstruct them. Next, please. Next slide. So Joy Hardyo is very well known, writes now, living and very uh, quite young. And you must read her poems in order to uh, understand the way in which tribal folk literature that we find in India and also in South Asia, that is almost a sort of echo of the way in which she's writing and also in terms of the Aboriginal literature of Australia and the First Nation literature of Canada. Next piece. And now we come to immigrant writing. Yes, here we seem to uh, almost uh, perceive a sort of connection because most of the immigrant writings, Asian American writing, are by many women who have left India, especially from Bengal and Calcutta. And let us see uh, what uh, the way in which America has welcomed them. Next slide. So now we are looking at two important shifts again in culture. Because as I began by saying that it's about immigrant culture. But from the 1960s, this immigrant culture was no longer about indentured labor. It was more about high skilled labor from 1961 onwards after the signing of the Immigration Act. And this is after the World War. There was a great loss of human lives, the loss of human capital, especially of young men, led to this sort of emphasis like the domestic um, well, uh, arena were asked to make babies, which, is what, which led to the second women's liberation movement. Similarly, the emergence of high-skilled immigrants and the settling of high-skilled immigrants from all over the world. It is not only South Asians or Southeast Asians who have this passion to reach the United States. Even young people from Europe, Britain, and also from West Asia the uh, colonizers called it the Middle East. It seemed that America was the answer to all the unhappiness that they were experiencing. And there would be a sort of resurgence of life the moment one stepped into onto the American soil. And the first emphasis was that everything uh, all these immigrants with whatever their cultures, whatever their religions, whatever their skin color would be all part of a melting pot. And then they would be a part of being America, forgetting everything else about their lives. A fusion of nationalities, cultures and ethnicities. Next. But the melting pot had to be reje rejected. Human beings cannot be absolutely homogenized. The heterogeneity and the diversity of cultures must be there. Human beings demand their identities, their special identities, their ethnic identities, and not only religious identities. Yes. So then the salad bowl theory replace the melting pot idea about the cultural and ethnic makeup of the United States. The melting pot idea was that America brought many different cultures and ethnicities together and melted or blended them all up into a uniquely American identity. But the salad bowl was about salads of various sorts, 
and which were all together. But of course, there are skeptics. Intellectuals are get great skeptics all the time. Excuse me. So, and there are skeptics all the time. And so as a result, they said, oh, well, the salad is all right. And you are putting in everything together, which Shashi Tharoor has called the thali here. And so the thali culture. But what about the salad dressing? Is that not a sort of hegemonic control of the salad bowl? I think Shubir will answer that one. The next question. Ma'am, you have muted yourself. I couldn't hear you. Yeah, accidentally you might have muted yourself. All right. Uh, now can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Oh, OK. I'm, I'm so sorry. So multiculturalism and plural monoculturalism. Multiculturalism is something we are very f uh, familiar with. Plural monoculturalism is something that I, if you are going to uh, do research on American literature, this is a book you have to read. Identity and Violence, The Illusion of Destiny by Amartya Sen. And here he talks about monoculturalism. He talks about multiculturalism. He talks about singular affiliations. He talks about multi-ethnicity. And these are absolutely crucial for those who are uprooted from their homelands and are rerouted in an alien landscape and an alien culture and how they want to replant themselves, reroot themselves in that culture. And so plural monoculturalism, that is to preserve your ethnic culture, but at the same time also recognize the plurality of diverse cultures around oneself. And so, of course, the singular affiliation with which one steps into a multicultural society has to be revised is what uh, Amartya Sen talks about. And when he talks about identities, I am a little tempted to uh, read this a uh, little uh, bit about how he describes himself. I can be at the same time an Asian, an Indian citizen, a Bengali with Bangladeshi ancestry, an American or British resident, an economist, a dabbler in philosophy, an author, a Sanskritist, a strong believer in secularism and democracy, a man, a feminist, a heterosexual, a defender of gay and lesbian rights with a non-religious lifestyle from a Hindu background, a non-Brahmin, and a non-believer in an afterlife. So all these are part of one's identities. It is not only one's own religious identity that one needs to showcase if one has been uprooted from their native uh, locations. Next. Next, please. So now the buzz terms that we use in our understanding of American literature and culture are transnationalism. And of course, you have to think in terms of Hobi Bhabha and the third space. And yet, those were not enough. Because if you leave out intersectionality, you are leaving out diversity. So, a student of mine who now teaches at the Michigan University, I'm very proud to talk about her for one minute. And that is because all her degrees are from Calcutta University. No degree uh, is from any foreign university. There is a common notion that if you do not have a degree from a first world university, it would be difficult for you to find a job in the first world, which is absolutely the desire of all young people. And why not? But in her case, 
she all her degrees were from Calcutta University, including her PhD, and she worked on Australian feminist writers for that. But now she introduces herself in the United States as a transnational intersectional feminist thinker and feminist writer. So this change is a more recent one. And the emphasis is on location, race, caste, class, gender, sexuality, religion, education, profession, and one's own particular ideology, what that, whatever that may be. And that is what intersectionality and the standpoint theory becomes so very important in terms of interpreting the diasporic literature of the present. Next, please. And so just run through these, yes, Bharati Mukherjee. Next. She was here in Kolkata, Chitra Banerjee, student of Presidency College, as you many of you know. So Bharati, of course, I think it was Loreto. Next, Jhumpa Lahiri, second generation. And so, of course, her visits to India are that of a tourist. And so that is where we uh, sometimes make a mistake when uh, Desh Potrika came out with a volume, a uh, particular issue saying that from Jibonanondo to Jhumpalahiri. Jhumpalahiri is neither Indian nor does she write about India. Next, please. And some of the winners of the Nobel Prize. Uh, in America, you will notice that they are men, very few women, as a matter of fact, I think just two. And then uh, Bob Dylan is a songwriter and Louise Glück, who recently got the Nobel Prize as a poet. And shall we move on to the next slide? And if... Uh, you are interested. These are some of the books that you may want to look at if you are going to study American literature, not only at the uh, honors or postgraduate level, but also as a researcher of American literature. And as a native informant, I would think that your choice could well be diasporic literature, but then you should be free to choose whatever you want. Yes, because America is a democratic country, the world's oldest democracy, and we are the world's largest democracy. And so the most important slide now. Thank you so much for your patience. It went on and on. I think the evolution of American literature has really taken up too much time. Thank you very much. And I'm sure that all the participants still who are with us, we are really mesmerized with your, with your presentation and your really encouraging slides so thank you very much thank you so much Bodhishanda, could you please uh, 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 yes thank certainly you. sir i was just also however as ma'am said greed is good in terms of the american dream i was just wondering do we have any questions or do we have time for any questions I think well, I'm afraid that if we can open the floor for questions, this is going to run till midnight. 
Yes. 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 Some other time. But the questions are already pouring in. Oh my God! The chat box. <laughs> Can we all collect them all together? See if there are comments. Then uh, just read the comments. If there is a specific question, and if there are similar questions. Then we can take them one or two. I was wondering if we could uh, take the questions and maybe uh, send them through email to ma'am. Yes. Yes. Probably. Yeah, that would be very good. We will collect the questions and ma'am, I'm going to send you an email from the uh, SNU ID that we have. Our department will like. All right. Good. So you are very sensitive to the center. Yeah, thank you. Excuse me, ma'am. It's Shoykot. I'm from the University of Calcutta. I just wanted to ask you this question. Many of my friends wanted to attend this lecture, but they couldn't somehow. But I just want to ask you, where would this lecture be posted so that they can go through it? Please ask the organizer, Shoykot. I think Moni Kinkini or Sir, Shui Sir, if you could enlighten us, or Praval Sir, you could enlighten us on that. Yeah, it's uh, already recorded. It's already recorded. Yeah. I think Professor Shubhendra. Actually, can organize it with the Monique and Kini so that we can actually have it. Either even yes. we can have it in the YouTube. Huh? I yes, so. we are actually recording the lecture and we are going to put it up on the channel of the university of the Department of English and we are going to share the link with uh, the participants if they can leave their email ID in the chat box. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, ma'am, for the lecture. Okay, just a suggestion, Monique and Kini. Perhaps we, when we are collating the questions, we can also collate the emails of people who want to access the lecture. Right, if right. That is, that is what we will do because the messages are also getting recorded, so we don't have to collate them. We will just send the uh, uh, link down. We we'll just uh, just download it and send it to Ma'am via email, and we will take the email IDs and send those uh, the recording, the video link of YouTube. To those particular participants who are interested to know about the recording. Yeah, but already a lot of uh, email ID are being poured. So yes, you sir, uh, and Bodhichanda, Bodhichanda, and Bodhichanda is mentioning. You can also collect all of them and then you can send it. Our SDU. Yes, yes, yeah. It's being recorded, sir. Yes. Sir. Yes, sir. We have an active Desmu uh, mail account. Exactly. And we have an exactly. Desmu channel also YouTube channel. So we are going to use yeah. these uh, avenues to reach out mm -hmm. to everyone who's interested. Morning, can you could you uh, if uh, with uh, uh, so sir and everybody is my seniors permission. Morning, can you can you just put the there's new email ID though over there? Maybe that might be helpful for people. Yes, that's a good idea. Yeah. So, Shok, yeah. you can easily understand that you have to deliver more lectures and uh, maybe when we are going to be open, you have to come and visit the university because uh, the interactions are always good and uh, we look forward to that. Actually. Thank you so much, Drubo. And finally, Amiki, uh, Oh, you are my girlfriend from the presidency. <laughs> <laughs> I look at that mischievous laugh of Shubhi. <laughs> well, I was just thinking about the past tense. <laughs> uh, but uh, Motishandar, could you please go on to uh, the book of thanks? Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Well, what can I say? I think we I capture the emotions of everybody here when I say we are enthralled enlightened enriched delighted and honored absolutely honored to have you with us and with to uh, listen to this lecture ma'am you were you were wondering about boring us but maybe say that we were not bored for a second as i said greed is good and we would love to have more of this and what was was incredible about this lecture was that you covered such a swath from the 15th century to the 21st century and so lucidly because we had so many students who might be encountering American letter lecture for the first time and thank goodness for technology because this is such a treasure we are going to treasure it and we are going to I'm sure both our students and uh, we as young scholars are going to revisit it again and again and again
oh. and let me just also take this opportunity to add that we would be delighted if you could take a sequel lecture on a, specifically on black american literature because we do have beloved on our syllabus apart from other things the, the yeah. color code is also there so that would be another treasure trove for um our students and as um vice chancellor sir said once things open up we would love to have you back because you know obviously this is not your first association with uh, snu you have been a keynote speaker at our class third webinar on tagore uh i just have to mention uh, a few other people of course without whom today's evening would not have been possible of course we would have to start with our chancellor sir um mr shotam rai choudhury his innovative ideas and humanitarian projects keep on inspiring us and infusing us with energy to do the best for this institution in whatever capacity that we can uh, we can have and then next comes of course our honorable vice chancellor sir who is a ball of energy a ball of you know he's always encouraging us always inspiring us uh, to take the departments to new heights but at the same time he's also he also always gives us the liberty to take our own unique paths so that is a rare balance which he manages by some magic but he does uh, then of course our registrar sir tireless worker a real soldier who we always run to with whatever trouble we have and he's always like you know it's all going to get settled calm down it it'll say it'll settle down coming to desnew i know sir said you know so warn me against this but at least a mention must be made about dr shubhi dhar our mentor and advisor who we all affectionately refer to as the guiding star of our department and also our magical mentor uh, our hod sir our head of the department dr probal roy choudhury who recently joined the desney family this year in fact but within this short span he has enriched us with his experience and erudition and he has also taught us a new style of leadership which is not based on an, any kind of aggressive display of power but with a unique blend of humility grace and dignity so thank you very much sir and may i also take this opportunity to add that uh, the next saturday with the scholar will actually be delivered by dr probal rai choudhury of course we will uh, circulate the details as well as the details as and when we come closer to the day and i have to mention our des new team my fellow colleagues in the, in the department Uh, the old guns of course who've been here from the very beginning monique ekini uh, dr prashant goshal professor shudesha das and our new uh, entrants dr orpita ghotok our visiting members uh, you know uh, devdatta mitro paloma chatterji kothakoli shengupto and shantideep uh, chatterji without you this would not be what it is today because you people don't just work with your intellectual and at times your muscular might but you work with your hearts and your souls which is why desnew is not just a department desnew is a family and finally last but not the least you students without whom we will not even exist because in these very very trying times you students keep us inspired disciplined sane and prevent us from descending into a vortex of depression and very very dark days so on that note i think it's 8 uh, 10 uh, i will end here thank you to everyone present here to the vast audience and definitely once again ma'am thank you very very much and we do look forward to listening uh, to your lecture again thank you all of you mrc i want to say to uh, uh, stg ma'am ma'am i have have that luck to attend both of your gender studies and american literature classes and this lecture took me back to my ma days i would look forward for many more lectures like this i really it was really nostalgic because most of the time 
we had your classes on gender studies and American literature. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, I, I, I joined SNU, ma'am. So you have a new and old friend in the group as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> so wonderful. <laughs> really. So as I said in the beginning that I'm not among strangers, but I, it's all you, with all of you. Young friends and also my own contemporaries. So good night to everybody. Good night to everybody. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. And enjoy night, the weekend. Thank you. Bye. Stay safe. Bye. Uh, a personal thank you to you. Thanks very, very, very much. Thank you, ma'am. 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 Wear masks. Okay. Ma'am, so good to see you after a long time. <laughs> Same here, ma'am. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Seeing all of you, and that you are uh, even interested in uh, uh, listening to a teacher who taught you uh, s several years back. I don't know. Shongjukta Di. Shongjukta Di. That time, and I still love you a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Ma'am, may I just add that I just heard one of your lectures way, way back in my younger days when I was a visiting faculty. You gave a lecture on gender studies at Sri Shikshayatan College. And ever oh. since then, I have been looking forward to listening to your lectures. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Drubo Amiyaka, I'm on a fishing expedition. <laughs> so I think we should call it an evening. Enjoy yourselves now, Thank and you, then you have the whole of Sunday. I hope it will be a nice day for everybody, though there's a threat of a bhara koral or something, but <laughs> enjoy. And okay. Bye. We will be back with more. This is one of our Saturday with the Scholar sessions. And the next one, as uh, Professor Mubhushandar Rochaduri told you, is around the corner, maybe next week or the week after that. And Please rally on, be with us, and we are going to travel and have intellectual fun. Thank you very much, and thank you once again for your presence. It was a pleasure thank listening you. to you. I mean, it's something I could, you know, I could go on listening to you for hours on end. I should be in it too. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay then. Okay, bye. Everybody. I would request everybody to kindly leave the meeting. We can just uh, maybe wrap up the session. Thank you. Shoini, can you please leave the meeting?